When most people think about filmmaking, they presume films are expensive to shoot. But that doesn't have to be the case. You can absolutely shoot a feature film for little money, but to do so successfully, you need to do a few things first. In this video, we're going to share six things you need to do to produce a successful micro-budget film. But before going any further, let's get this debate out of the way. What amount of money are we actually talking about when we say micro-budget feature film? This varies on after low budget, no budget and micro budget are used interchangeably. The Screen Actors Guild defines anything under 300,000 as ultra low budget, but for this video we are talking about numbers much lower than that. Under 20,000? Under 10,000? In our days of running a film festival we have even seen feature films produced for under 1,000 that look fantastic and told great stories. And one more note before we lay down this list. We are not talking about film gear in this video. That's a practical consideration. You can shoot films on your phone these days. Steven Soderbergh has done it several times. And you can even use natural light if you want. Terence Malick does it often. Those money saving measures are different topics. This video is about ideas, attitudes and concepts that you need to grasp in order to give your film a chance of being firstly completed and secondly successful. The best way to write a micro-budget feature script or an outline is to first start with your resources. So make a list of what is freely or easily available to you. Resources include locations you can film in and what interesting props and costumes are on hand. What location do you have access to? Your house, a friend's garage maybe, a local park, your dad's workplace. Keep thinking and get your friends involved and brainstorm together. Locations can be one of the biggest production costs if you are not careful. So it's become a cliche now to see a micro-budget film set in one location as a way to save money. But the thing is, it does save money. As long as you have a valid story reason for doing it, filming in a few locations or even one doesn't have to be a limitation. Buried starring Ryan Reynolds is a perfect example of a film shot entirely in one location, inside a coffin of all things. That uses this limitation and turns it into a positive. Buried makes the limitation thrilling because the concept is striking, the story is well thought out and the stakes keep rising throughout the film. Our own micro-budget feature, Machination, is about Maria, a woman losing her grip on reality which causes her to self-isolate within her home. 85% of the film is set inside Maria's home, which was our own apartment at the time. So location costs zero. The advice goes all the way back to Robert Rodriguez and his iconic book, Rebel Without a Crew. Write a story based on what you have available to you. I don't know if Rodriguez was the first to say it, but over 25 years later, the advice still rings true. Limiting your location also allows you to film faster as there is less packing up and moving cast and crew. Less production time equals less money spent. That said, you don't have to limit yourself to one or very few locations if you don't want to. For our film Friends First and Fireworks, which we shot in a single night, we still used seven different locations during production. All the locations were within close proximity and one of our crew members had a big eight-seater van to move everyone around. From an apartment to the suburban streets to a pier to two different beaches, we squeezed all these locations into one night which made things much more dynamic and exciting than limited it all to a single apartment. On another feature, Four Fans, we filmed for two weeks using 18 different locations across two different countries. The budget was still under 20,000 euro. But to pull off these productions with dynamic locations and micro budgets, you need to be super organized with great schedules to follow. And you also need to. Be prepared to multitask or, in other words, keep the numbers of cast and crew small. Small crews move faster. There's just less moving, thinking, talking past to organise. They're easier to motivate and they tend to work harder. There's not someone else to do it so nobody stands around. When everyone around you is working hard and you yourself lead by example, your crew will follow. There is nowhere to hide. But this means that you and everyone on the team needs to be ready to multitask and wear many hats. This is where hierarchy gets thrown out the window and with it, woo, egos. On four fans, our crew was three people for half the shoot and only two people, Ivan and I, for the other half of the shoot. 
Ivan was the director, DOP, sound recorders, gaffer, and his own AD. Sometimes he would even operate two cameras by himself if everything was locked off. For shots like this, we would use a C-stand to be our boom operator. Myself, I would take care of the costume, set dressing, help set up lights, manage the catering, act as a runner, plus also take on sound in the outdoor locations when Ivan couldn't do it himself because he was running a handheld camera. When we did have our assistant Yelena to help out as another multitasker, things obviously got considerably easier. So we don't advise getting so extreme and filming with a crew of one or two people on every film. But we do advise to keep your crew as small as you feasibly can, especially if you are paying your crew like we do. Less people equals less costs. There are also other benefits of keeping the team numbers low. You won't be as obvious when you shoot outdoors compared to big films that have 20 people standing behind the camera. You can employ a run and gun style of filmmaking like documentaries do and you can get a lot of great location shots that big budget films had to pay big money to do. On 4Fans, we showed around the famous monuments of Paris without any issues because we were just four people with a small gimbal and camera. Even Sofia Coppola filmed on the streets of Tokyo without permits for Lost in Translation. She relied on the same concept, keep it small, get in and get out. Now, disclaimer, we are not encouraging anyone to break the law, but the reality is you have to be bold to be a micro-budget filmmaker. You have to decide what risks are worth it for each shot. Sometimes it really is better to ask for forgiveness than to get caught up in the costs and red tape of asking for permission. Either way, embrace multitasking. Learn as many production and post-production roles as you can. The more you can do yourself, the more money you will save. But how do you become a multitasking maestro? Well... You will make mistakes, every filmmaker does, and we still do. But it's best if your biggest mistakes are made early on in your career on short films. Use them to practice, use them to try different roles, to work with different actors and crew. Use shorts to test ideas, even if it's ideas from the feature film you want to shoot in the future. See what works. This is your chance to play with natural light versus artificial light, to experiment with lenses, and to also learn how to lead teams. The best way to learn is by doing it. The more you learn on short films, so we have an intruder here. <laughs> Where the stakes are often lower, you'll be prepared to tackle feature films. We made short films for several years before we made our first feature. The first few short films we made, made mostly his, were unwatchable. But the more we made, the more we learnt and improved. And despite being full-time filmmakers today, we still make shorts where we can. Doing a series called Life Improvised just because we still enjoy making shorts. When we travel, like to shoot these small micro shorts and they're usually half day projects that we shoot with friends or as a way to discover new actors or test concepts for future projects. Very few filmmakers can go straight into making feature films and do it really well. So take your time to learn your craft on short films first. Feature and I interrupt this video to bring you a special announcement. If you're liking what you see, don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this and hit that bell so you get that notification. Now back to the program. Often the highest costs you will incur besides post-production are cast and crew fees. It's why keeping the cast and crew small saves a lot of money. But there are other ways to secure a cast and crew for your micro-budget film. Get them excited about the story. Volunteers are out there and if they believe in the story or you as a filmmaker or as a decent human being, they may be willing to help. You can also straight out ask film students to volunteer in exchange for a credit or a reference. Just remember to pay it forward. Some cast and crew who helped us on unpaid shorts went on to work with us on paid feature films. If we like somebody and we work well with them, we will always try to keep them in mind for future roles. Your friends can help as volunteers too. Don't be afraid to ask. Often, the behind-the-scenes process of filmmaking is exciting to people not involved in filmmaking, and if they have the spare time, they are happy to come out and help for a day or even two. This comes in handy for scenes that require extras. We have lost track of how many bars, restaurants, warehouses, etc. We have filled up with friends and friends of friends to act as background talents. You can also rely on deferred wages. This means that there is no upfront payment for cast and crew, but if the film goes into profit, then they will be paid. Deferring a wage is not a new thing for micro-budget filmmaking, 
and it has a bad connotation as usually cast and crew are never paid because the film doesn't make money or the film does but the filmmaker doesn't follow through. So if you use this model you need to be upfront with your potential cast and crew and let them know there's a chance they'll never be paid. Don't be that delusional filmmaker who tells people you're making the next paranormal activity and you're going to make everyone rich and famous. Be honest, be humble, treat everyone like you'd want to be treated. And even if there is no money involved, you can still run a set where everyone is happy and finds value in the experience. You can even add additional incentives for cast and crew, like sharing a percentage of all the streaming sales the film makes. This way everyone has a greater stake in the film and its success. We did this with friends, foes and fireworks. Or you can offer low pay to your cast and crew, a nominal fee, cover travel expenses. Depending on where they're coming from, perhaps a per diem, a food allowance is also appropriate. We did all of this on 4Fans. If money is the issue stopping somebody working on your film, well, they're not the right person for your film anyway. My attitude is, if they only care about the money, they go work on that corporate gig or crew on that Hollywood production. You need to inspire people with more than money because money is the one thing you are in short supply of. So how do you do this? You build a reputation as a filmmaker that people want to work with. You treat people well. You write a story crew connect with and want to be a part of. You write characters actors want to play because they are fun or challenging or they have great depth or maybe all three. You treat people with respect and you're open and honest and you make your filmmaking family feel as valued as your real family. The key to making any micro budget feature film run smoothly comes down to planning. Of course things don't always go to plan but better to wing it when things go off track than to not have any track to follow in the first place. Learn to schedule, do a shot list and storyboard if you can. These are skills you can learn and practice on short films. You can tackle schedules by acting as an AD on your own shorts or volunteering on others. You can learn shot lists by working with a more experienced DOP. You can watch YouTube tutorials. But it's always a good idea to give a scene or a shot more time than you think you need rather than to sell yourself short on time and then have to work under pressure or scramble to get back on track. This is where mistakes are made. Also, rehearse your actors. Know the rehearsal is not the first take as some filmmakers like to say. Give your actors time to sit with you and talk about the character and the story and work out any questions and issues before you get on to set. We have found that the more time an actor has to talk through a character with us, the more natural the performance and the dialogue will be. Plus the takes move more quickly as the actor already knows what is expected and the last thing you want is one of those moments that the director fears on set where the actor asks, what's my motivation? The rehearsal process can also lead to positive character and story changes as you discover things and see what works and what doesn't. For instance, the rehearsal for Machination led to many story changes as we observed and discussed Maria. These discussions will spark new ideas and we'll be constantly taking notes and making adjustments. Only as the final rehearsals ended and we approached production week did we write the final version of the outline to guide us through production. So don't skip rehearsal, it's as important for you as it is for the cast. If you really want to keep the budget low, you need to be willing to sacrifice to cut costs. Nothing in your story is sacred. You can always find another cheaper, often more creative way to achieve what you want. This means being flexible. When we first wrote the outline for Machination, we envisioned a physical manifestation of the germs Maria fears and sees around her. It would take the form of slime sliding down the walls that we'd done through CGI. But in order to do this, we would need a green screen set up in our apartment, a post-production coordinator to oversee the technical aspects on set, and expensive visual effects. It was in no way budget friendly. But because we were open to changes, we realised we could actually make Maria's fears manifest in another way. Using live worms to represent the character feeling dirty and contaminated. And we could do all this practically without the need for any CGI, cutting a big proportion of the potential cost. We all go into each film with a vision on how things will look and be done. But to achieve our visions, we need to rely on creativity rather than money. And creativity thrives when the mind is open to change. Another potential cost for filmmakers are film festivals. 
but are they worth the entry fee? Well, check out this video to find out. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe so we can bring you more content like this.